Zoomilink is the hub for connecting you to the larger Air Force Academy graduate community. See how your fellow graduates are already gathering online to discuss, advise, and serve. Connect with graduates at all stages of life and start a conversation about careers, transition tips, and preparing for your future. And with Zoomilink now open to all current Academy cadets, the time for connecting to the graduate community is more important than ever. Sign up at zoomilink.org and start connecting today. Brought to you by the Association of Graduates and the Air Force Academy Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our conversation series hosted by the Association of Graduates and the Air Force Academy Foundation. My name is Michelle Bergaman, and I serve as the Vice President for Alumni and Constituent Relations at the Association of Graduates. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Lieutenant General Richard Clark, Class of 1986, as the new USAFA Superintendent. As many of you know, General Clark was the USAFA Commandant from 2010 to 2012. He is a command pilot with more than 4,000 flying hours and 400 combat hours. During his USAFA years, Lieutenant General Clark was a standout linebacker for the Falcons. During this call, we'll be taking live questions, so please remember to submit those. Welcome back to USAFA, General Clark. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you, Michelle. It's good to see you and, uh, and everybody else out there. Even though I can't see you, I, I appreciate everyone joining in uh, to have a little time to talk. Um, so I think what I'd like to start with, though, is just to first uh, let everyone know how honored my family and I are to be here. Uh, this is a dream come true for me. As Michelle mentioned, I was the commandant, and that job was absolutely amazing. It was tough, um, but it was incredible. And uh, after that, I always had uh, a dream to be the superintendent. I was told it would never happen, and I you know, kind of went with that, and when it did, I was uh, shocked and surprised, and my family was thrilled about it. So we're we're so honored and privileged to be here. Um, I will tell you that um, what I do know is that our alumni is what's going to make us continue to thrive. Seeing the things that our alumni uh, and the AOG and the and the uh, foundation do for our school from my perspective now is absolutely amazing. I never had this perspective before, but seeing what our 50,000 graduates do for USAFA is, is really incredible. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, towards the end of, of my discussion. But um, what, I, what I wanna tell you though, is that my heart really is for the cadets. I mean, I, I love being around cadets. I love serving with cadets, former cadets. Um, and, uh, you know, my friends, the, my best friends in life, as you guys know, uh, many of them I made right here at USAFA. And I, I can remember in my, um, in my squadron the first night before uh, Iraqi freedom, I was a B-1 squadron commander, and I had the honor of leading our first four ship out. And I can remember of our four, four ships, three of my flight leads were, uh, or three of my aircraft commanders were academy grads. And just thinking, man, our, our school produces some amazing people. Um, I mean, they're amazing when they come in here and we prepare them to go do amazing things. And it is a really a, an honor for me to be a part of that and to play a small role in that. So, um, and the other thing is that I owe so much to our school. Um, I can look back on pretty much everything I've done and attribute it to uh, what the Academy did for me and set me up to be. And, uh, and, and I look at my kids and my, my family and, and I can draw the lines right back to Yusafa as well. Um, in fact, one of the stories I like to tell, and a lot of you have probably heard this, if you were on uh, the, um, uh, the AOG briefing or, or any of the uh, others that I might've um, been involved in, but I wanted to share this one with you because when I was a cadet, I played football like Michelle mentioned, and I dislocated both of my shoulders and I, some of my friends are probably out there and they know I used to, I would be out on the field and, and I'd 
dislocate my shoulder. I'd have to come off. I'd pop it back in, and then I'd go back into the game. It got to the point where I could pop it back in myself. It came out so many times, and both shoulders, four times on the left, five times on the right. And uh, it disqualified me from pilot training, though, my senior year. And I went through my flight, my flight physical, and I wasn't qualified to, to fly. And one day, um, if you guys remember, some of you will remember John Clune, our great athletic director uh, back in the 80s. Um, and he served for, for many years uh, loyally to USAFA. But he, um, he called me one day and said that General Skip Scott, our superintendent at the time, wanted to see me. And he wanted to talk about my future. So I put on my service dress and I came up. In fact, I'm sitting in the very office that I that I talked to him and I was in that corner right over there um, sitting down and he came over and he sat next to me and he asked me uh, if I wanted to fly. And flying is why I came here. Fly, play football, get a great education. My family wasn't military, but those were things that I saw that I could uh, achieve here at USAFA and that's why I came. Um, and one of those was going to be taken away from me. And it was it was kind of devastating. And he asked me if I still wanted to fly. And I said, yes, absolutely, sir, I do. And he said, well, I understand you're not medically qualified. And uh, and I understand it's because of your dislocated shoulders. And um, I want to tell you, I flew F-105s and I had to eject out of an F-105. He was a combat pilot, flew in, in Korea. And he said, I will tell you this, when you eject out of an airplane, the last thing on your mind is a dislocated shoulder. If that's all you have to worry about, you're in good shape. That should not keep anyone from flying an airplane. And he goes, he goes, go like this. And I did it. It even cracked a little bit while I was doing it, but I did it like it was nothing. And then he said, go like this. And I did it with the other arm. And he goes, you can fly, just stand by. And no kidding, like three days later or two days later, the med group commander called me in for another um, evaluation. And a couple of weeks later, I was off the pilot. I was uh, qualified for pilot training again. And um, it was uh, life changing for me. It set me on a different path. And it was because my superintendent took time for one cadet to change his life. And that's what he did for me. If I can do that for one or 4,000 cadets, I will do my best. I will put everything I have into changing the lives of these cadets if given the opportunity. And I owe that to um, first the legacy that General Scott and the other soups have left behind. I owe that to our academy. I owe that to our cadets who have, who have given up all kinds of opportunities to be here. I owe that to our country uh, because that's what our country deserves the best. And our, our, our school puts out the best. So I am inspired to be here. I wanna have a General Scott-like impact on every cadet that I possibly can. And that's what I will do uh, during my tenure as the superintendent. And when I came in and took command on, on Falcon Field, uh, September 23rd, um, I, uh, it was like a dream. It was almost uh, surreal that I was standing there. But I talked to everybody about my four priorities and the things that I thought about that I thought should happen while I was here. And what I'll tell you is they're not a lot different than what was already going on here. Um, because I honestly coming in and, and learning what I learned on the vision that General Silveria had, Jay Silveria Tonto, some of you know him, uh, I didn't wanna change and, and adjust what was going on here at USAFA because I think we're going in the right direction. But what I want to do is enhance and bring us to the next level with those and keep those things going. So my four priorities, and I'll do that quickly so we can uh, get to some questions and answers. But um, the first one is, is the enduring and, and the prime directive, and that's to develop leaders of character. That is what we do. People that live honorably, people that serve with integrity, people who do the right thing when nobody's looking, and they, and they develop that character here, that character of grit that character of perseverance, all the things that we um, hope that a cadet leaves here and graduates here with, that's what we need to do. Developing leaders of character, and that will always be the number one priority for all of us. Um, the next thing is really to defeat COVID-19. And that right now is the near-term threat. That's the threat that's right in front of our face, and, um, and we are fighting hard against COVID-19. 
As many of you know, Colorado Springs right now is engulfed. Um, I heard this morning 12.5% infection rate in Colorado Springs and growing. Um, we have our own issues here. We have uh, restricted the cadets. They can't uh, leave uh, the, um, the gates of USAFA. And we have gone to all virtual um, because of the number of, of positives that we have. So we are trying to bring that down. I think we're, we're in a, a better place and we're moving to an even better place, but, but we're, in a, we're in a fight right now. Um, and uh, we have a great pandemic math team that really sets us up to have an idea so that we can make informed risk-based uh, 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 data-based uh, decisions and to really have calculated risk in the things that we do. Um, our medical group is amazing as far as running surveillance testing and doing all the things that we need to do. The Department uh, uh, of Academics, the Dean side are doing other incredible things as far as helping us to run tests and making sure that we are able to sort of uh, survey the whole population. And then the Commandant and the Athletic Director are um, are swinging hard every day, especially on the commandant side, because of all the Q and I, the quarantine and isolation that they have to manage. That doesn't come without a cost, and uh, we have a lot of staff and faculty that are having to pay that cost to make sure that we're able to take care of our cadets and ensure their health and safety. So, defeating COVID nineteen is critical, and we are going to get to the graduation of the class of twenty twenty one. We're going to do that. Short term, we're going to get every cadet home for winter break. They need that. So we have goals in mind and things that we're striving for, but it is a struggle every day and we're fighting hard. So defeating COVID-19. The next thing is to prepare leaders for future conflict. Um, and my time at the Pentagon, um, I had a, a, a very good understanding of where our national defense strategy has taken us. Great power competition is the environment that we're living in in our global neighborhood. And we have to have leaders that can think about how do we compete at the, uh, at the international level? How do we compete with those near peer competitors, uh, Russia, China, not just at the, at the level of conflict, but that level below conflict to improve our nation's position so that we can always be in a place where we maintain our prosperity and our security. We have to have cadets can, that can think about problems that we don't even know about yet, that have the skills, not just the knowledge, but the skills to deal with the kinds of issues that they're gonna to have to deal with. It is a complex and complicated world out there, and I know you know that, but we have to have cadets that are ready uh, for that environment in the, in the very near future. So um, developing leaders for that, um, that environment is key. We're working on this, the space side with the Space Force stood up. Um, it, is, it is opening new horizons for us. Last year, we put 86 cadets into the Space Force. This year, we're going to put 90 cadets into the Space Force. We have a space major, a space minor, and we're preparing these guys to provide the, the kind of quality people that we need to our Space Force, and it is critical, and that demand is only going to grow. We just are, are uh, um, building our Center for Cyber Innovation. Uh, Joan and Paul Madera have, have been the lead on, on the donations for that and where we're able to go along with 350 or 400 other donors to build that center for us so that we can, can be dominant uh, in that domain as well. The cyber domain encompasses everything that we do in all domains and we need to have cadets that are steeped in it and ready to compete in that environment as well. And then um, there's also the Institute for Future Conflict that we're developing. And that will help us to build leaders across all pillars of the academy, not just the academic, but on the commandant side, the athletic side, it's about the holistic leader that we have to build to fight, to compete, to be able to be effective in that world 20 years from now. And we need people that can look out and be able to help us to integrate all of our program to ensure that we're building leaders that are ready for the future conflict. So that would be uh, my, my, uh, Third priority, and the final one is to be able to demonstrate dignity and respect to all. We have leaders here from all backgrounds, all parts of our country, different ethnicities, gender, race, um, but what our leaders have to be able to do is to lead people that don't look like them, lead people who don't talk like them, who aren't from where they are, but we have to be able to pull people in 
and manage our team and get the best out of every team member by making the connections that we need to make as leaders so that we can drive them to victory every time. And, and that's gonna require a certain level of empathy, a certain level of collaboration, of all those skills that allow a leader to take whatever team they're given and to, to, to drive them to peak performance. And that requires a certain level of dignity and respect for all. And we will always, always employ that, not only here at the academy, because it is vital for us here on so many different levels that we um, always demonstrate that across the board. But it's going to be vital for them when they go out, not only internally in our joint force, but also with our international partners to build our alliances that are so critical to our success. We need leaders that have that empathy, but that, that show that dignity, that show that respect for everyone that they come across. We need it now while they're here at the academy, and we need it when they go out 20, 30 years from now into our world, whether they're in the military, in the civilian world, that's what we need from our leaders. So those are my four priorities. Developing leaders of character, always, always number one. Um, uh, the future conflict is uh, preparing leaders for future conflict. We're going to be doing that always. Dignity and respect is going to be critical for us. And, and most importantly, the one that's right up in our face right now is defeating COVID-19. We have to beat that. Otherwise, we get derailed from everything in the short term. So those are the things that I wanted to share with you. And um, the last thing that I'll, I'll just take a, a quick minute and then I'll go back to Michelle for some questions and answers. Um, I just wanted to talk really quickly about some of the projects that we have um, here at the Academy. Uh, the chapel is under huge renovation. I'm looking at it right now. We're building a scaffolding over it, 160-ish million dollar program to revamp the entire chapel. I actually got to climb up in it and stand under uh, under one of the steeples. It was pretty cool, um, but it is going through a significant renovation. It's gonna be awesome, but it's not gonna be for about uh, four years until it's done, but pretty amazing. The air gardens getting totally um, refinished, revamped. We're gonna have outdoor classes in it. It's gonna be beautiful. Um, you would think that Yusuf is a big construction site right now, but it is a sign of progress. We're looking forward to a new visitor center and an entire complex um, out the north gate where we're going to have a hotel, we're going to have a visitor center, it's going to be restaurants, it's really going to be amazing. A developer in, in the Springs is uh, working, with, uh, working with us on that, not funded yet completely, but we're moving towards that and that's going to be a very exciting project. Um, and there's more that I could talk about, but there's so many amazing things. I already talked about the Cyber Innovation Center. The, the Madera Cyber Innovation Center is gonna be incredible. Um, so there's lots of great projects going on right now. Um, there's, there's other topic areas that I think will probably come up um, in the Q&A um, that I am uh, more than happy to talk about. And if they don't, and Michelle gives me a few moments at the end, I can, uh, I can bring those up. But right now, um, Michelle, I'd like to throw up you and, and talk about some um, other issues that people wanna talk about. Thank sure. you. Great, thank you for all of that. Um, so we do have a few questions that came in already and we have questions rolling in right now. Um, but to start off with, so this week, uh, the theme at USAPA is warrior ethos. Um, so the Academy defines warrior ethos as the embodiment of the warrior spirit, tough mindedness, tireless motivation, an unceasing vigilance, a willingness to sacrifice one's life for country if necessary, and a commitment to the world's premier air, space, and cyberspace force. We know that you commanded, or you were a command pilot with a lot of flying hours, and over 400 of those were combat. What does warrior ethos mean to you, and how did the academy prepare you? Well, I, the academy, um, I think just, just by nature, the, the shared um, experiences that we have here, the challenges that we face here, the perseverance, the dedication, the commitment that you have to employ just to uh, just to be able to get through the program builds a certain warrior ethos. And the one thing that I, I want to make clear, though, is a warrior ethos is just not applicable in combat. A warrior ethos is, is something that um, I think embodies the way a person attacks a problem. How do you handle whatever situation you're in? Are you able to persevere? Are you able to drive through and lead your team to victory 
with a certain boldness and a, and a willingness to take the appropriate risks um, to, to ensure that you achieve the objectives that you set out to achieve. It, it's, a, it's a mindset. And I think that the academy certainly set me off um, on a good footing there. I mean, as an athlete, which every cadet is an athlete, um, you learn that on the fields. That's why we do it. We all learn that quote by MacArthur, on the fields of friendly strife, are sown the seeds that on other fields on other days will sow the, the, the will reap the, the fields of victory or it, I wasn't a good cadet, so I forgot the quote, but you know what I'm saying? Uh, but that was a great one, right? And uh, there's, that's what you get, man. It's been too long since I was a four degree and had to say a quote, but you know what I'm saying? And, and I think that the academy really did um, sow those seeds for me. It got me ready to do so many different things like all of us. I mean, you, you come out of here with something different and I think it helps you to, to, to be, um, sort of have that competitive mindset in everything that you do. But the key is that we have to be able to compete in the right way. We have to know what victory means. We have to understand that it's not always win at all costs. We have to understand um, what it means to, maybe you, you lose the battle, but you win the war. You know, so there's there's so many things that that embody a warrior ethos, but I will tell you that I learned it here, and this is where it starts, and it just goes from there. Those those foundational um, ideals that are that are given to us as as cadets at the Air Force Academy, we still do that. We still do that. We still believe in that now. Great. Well, it sounds like you need to go back to the four degrees and do some knowledge training. With you. <laughs> I, no, I'll never get into that one. <laughs> But I don't know the quote very well either, so I, I give you credit for your knowing more than I do. I got I got a third of it, so. <laughs> um, so also, in the definition of warrior ethos, when it mentions the tough-mindedness, we've gotten a few questions that are related to uh, seeking help for mental health um, and how that then can affect possibly an AFSC or a pilot slot. If they're going to seek that help, um, does that affect them in any way? for getting those jobs that they might want in the future? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, so the, the, the fact is um, we have to communicate that this is, it's not an automatic disqualifier from any career field if you seek mental health. Now, there are some conditions um, that could have an impact on someone, right? On, on their future, but for the most part, um, Folks who seek mental health, it's just like if you break your arm uh, in intramurals, you have to go to the doctor. If you have a mental health issue, we have to take them um, uh, to, the, to the next level to get the care that they need from a mental health perspective. And, and we have to help cadets and, and really all of us understand that. That is not just an issue at USAFO because there is a stigma that is sometimes attached to mental health and we have to drive that down. And I dealt a lot with it in the nuclear world um, with the personal reliability program. So many times um, we had people that had to get um, help or, or attention uh, uh, from a, a mental health provider. It did not derail their career. And I share this with cadets. And in fact, today, I mean, I'll, I'll just share with this group. I shared a personal experience um, of my own with the four degrees as we were talking of a time that I needed to, uh, to seek some assistance. So um, it, it is not a, an automatic disqualifier by any stretch of the imagination. It's just like anything else. We have to work through the issue and then, um, and then we go from there. But here's the, the truth is, if they don't get that help, they may not ever get to where they need to go because they're unhealthy um, and we need to take care of them. So we just have to continue to encourage people to do it and let them know that that stigma is not there. It, it's about them getting the help that they need and that we make that very clear to them. So we'll continue to communicate that to our cadets because it's important. Their mental health is just as important as their physical health and we have to take it that way. Um, another question that just kind of came in kind of related to the, the qualifications or disqualifications uh, for mental health. People are wondering what about COVID and how that's going to affect um, commissionings and qualifications? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And, and just to be honest, we don't know. Um, we don't know right now. So there's a, there's a lot of talk about what it, the myocarditis, 
myocarditis. I can't uh, exactly, but it's the heart uh, scarring of the heart. Um, and uh, there's other um, potential effects that could have an impact. But right now, um, we don't know what those might be. And to be honest, in our in our uh, cadet population, we haven't had that many. Um, I mean, when you talk about it relatively, that many uh, symptomatic uh, COVID situations. So it's really those symptomatic situations where people have, you know, the 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 cardio or the respiratory issues um, that we're concerned about. And we haven't had very many of those so far, um, knock on wood. But our main goal is to keep the number of, uh, of infections down so that we don't have to worry about that in the future. Um, so time will tell on that one. And I wish I had a better answer, but I, I really can't say what those cadets or, or really those airmen and, and Space Force warriors out there, how this might affect them. But I think the real goal is to follow the guidelines, to protect ourselves, to wear our masks, to protect our teammates and our wingmen so that we don't get the illness and that we don't have to worry about that. Okay, well, we'll stand by for any updates that you have on that because I know that's a question that comes in quite a bit. Um, so the next question, you stated at your change of command that your top priority as superintendent is fulfilling the academy's mission of developing leaders of character. Honor violations are on the rise and it appears the honor staff is undermanned and overtasked. How will you address what is clearly becoming a crisis of lack of integrity at USAFA? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I would characterize it as a crisis of lack of integrity. I will say that we did have um, an issue recently um, with some cadets that uh, had an issue with virtual uh, a virtual learning incident where they were taking a GR on uh, in a virtual platform. And we had a number of cadets that uh, uh, did show that lack of integrity. Uh, what I'll say is that the large majority, I would say almost three quarters, 70% of them admitted immediately. And we were able to um, to deal with them. They were younger, three, three degree, four degree. Um, and then there's the, the other 30% are either cadets who are older that we have to deal with or cadets who didn't admit. So those are the ones that we're gonna have to uh, really put our focus on, but those others, we're gonna put them into the probation period. We basically fast track them right to probation and our probation program is actually pretty good. And we get a lot of support from our alumni on that 95% success rate with our uh, our probation efforts. So we were able to fast track those guys. And, and honestly, the honor system, it is a developmental program. Um, we have to be able to take people from where they are and help them develop into people that live honorably. And, uh, and we're gonna take that, um, basically take that opportunity. Now, as far as the broader system goes, um, whoever, sent that question i think they are they are on to something and every uh periodically we do need to take a look at our honor system and see are there changes or adjustments that we need to make and are we serving our cadets well with our honor system and we are going to um, take a look at that we're going to undertake uh, uh, a review i'll call it right now of our honor system to see if there's things that we need to do that we can actually serve our cadets better so that they come out of here with that um, ideal and that internalization of living honorably. So, um, so yes, I, I think um, we are looking at it. We are dealing with this recent incident and I think we're, we're in a, a good place to move forward on, on both fronts. So with the um, expansion of online classes is that something that is kind of propelling this as well, that not everybody's in person, having that in-person learning? Well, I, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's propelling it. Um, I think that sometimes it, there's areas that we hadn't, um, are, are new to us. You know, there, it's not a, an area that we have dealt with and, and especially in this virtual environment, it, it puts us into a different situation and a situation that we haven't uh, haven't been in ever really. So um, it's it's new to us and it's something that we have to deal with. 
And, and honestly, we have to take this as a learning opportunity and we have to continue to develop leaders of character. And, and there's a, there's another world out there that's different than any of us went through um, in the past. It is a different world. So we have to take a look at our, at our system now to make sure that it fits in this world and that it still develops the same leaders of character that we've always developed. Great. Um, speaking of learning opportunities, I know a lot of things got canceled because of COVID last year. Um, what are you looking at for hopeful experiences during the summer of 2021, um, whether internships or Operation Air Force, those types of things? Yeah, so um, a lot of it depends on COVID and, and how the, the pandemic is managed and contained, but we are still able to do a lot of things virtually um, and we are taking advantage of those opportunities and anything that we can do um, from sort of internships and ops, Air Force, things like that, that we can send cadets out, we're going to take advantage of those. But, but really, it's the health and safety of our cadets that's going to be primary. So we're going to look at those opportunities. As far as things internal to USAFA, like uh, basic cadet training or other programs that we do here, airmanship programs and things like that, we're finding ways to work through that so that we can still provide those developmental opportunities to all of our cadets. But I, I will tell you that our staff, the Commandant, Athletic Director, uh, the Dean staff are being very creative in meeting the requirements of our cadets and their developmental um, opportunities in this environment. So I, I'm, I'm really proud of them. And, it, you know, I've only been on the job now seven weeks, mm -hmm. but I am impressed. And I, and I think that you would be too if you could see the creativity that goes into us figuring out how do we work through COVID, how do we fight through it, and how do we beat this and not let it derail us from our program. So I'm very proud of the team. Well, it's good to hear because I know a lot of them missed out last summer, so hopefully there's a lot more this summer to offer. Um, so an easy question for you. Oh, um, what's your favorite Mitchell Hall meal? Oh, so... It may not be a meal, and they don't serve it now. I, I, I don't know. I think the F or the Food and Drug Administration would kill me if I brought it back. Mitch's Mountain was like the best thing ever. And when I was the commandant, uh, it was gone, and I brought it back. And I, man, I heard from everybody. I think, I think the president was after me for that one because you know, it's, you know, Mitch's Mountain. You were, were you around for Mitch's Mountain? Do you know what that is? I, I'm <laughs> I don't know all about this mountain, but I've seen pictures, so I can only assume. Oh, it's beautiful. It's so, it was so good. I can't tell you how excited I was to see that on the table. It, you just want to pick it and just like <laughs> rub it on your face. It's so good. All that ice cream. And as a cadet, you know, you're looking for those small victories. I loved Mitch's Mountain. So I want to bring it back, but they're, you know, they're like, ah, health, calories, you know, but I mean, you can look at me and tell that that doesn't mean as much to me as it probably should, but Mitch's Mountain, that was a long answer to your question. I got a little excited thinking about it. No, I mean, everybody that I know of gets excited about Mitch's Mountain, so it's all good. Um, so we just had a question come in. Um, so obviously the football team did the Red Tails uniforms. So Red Tails and, and the Tuskegee Airmen are kind of the forefront of a lot of people's minds with the Air Force right now. Uh, so General Brown said that he would he would fly the P-51 as his favorite air, favorite aircraft because the Tuskegee Airmen flew them and they paved the way for him. Will you have the cadets read General Benjamin Davis's biography in a leadership class? Um, well, what I, I may, I think our what we are going to do, though, is educate our uh, uh, our cadets on. Um, General Benjamin O. Davis and the Tuskegee Airmen. In fact, you could probably see my red tail right behind me. Um, they were certainly heroes of mine, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, and, and really helped to shape the future of our Air Force, just like so many other of our great Air Force leaders. But the, one of the things that I'm most proud of is the fact that we named our airfield Davis Field. And, mm -hmm. and that, that move alone helps to educate our cadets. Now they go, who was Davis? Oh, well, let me tell you about that. And I, and I have visions and so do so many others of us to make that field really a monument to the great Tuskegee Airmen. 
I mean, I want to see a P-51 on a stick out in front of uh, uh, that field. I want to see um, memorabilia buildings named after Tuskegee Airmen on our airfield and, and do things that really commemorate the, the great work that they did, not only as African-American airmen, but just as warriors and, and people who embody our core values. And we do that across the board, right? We, we try to um, have opportunities for our cadets to understand our forefathers and, and, and four sisters and four mothers. I, I don't know what four people, um, but to understand those who came before us and whose shoulders we stand on. And, and the Tuskegee Airmen are right there. So I think it's critical that we educate our, our uh, cadets on them, that the uniforms by the football team, that, that sent a message to the world of what we think about the Tuskegee Airmen and what they meant to our, uh, our, our Air Force and our Space Force. And, uh, and frankly, our field is a living monument to them. So yes, we will continue to educate them on all of our heroes and the Tuskegee Airmen are right there with them for sure. That's great. Um, so besides Mitch's mountain being gone, uh, what is one of the biggest or some of the biggest things that has changed uh, since you were here at USAPA as the Commandant of Cadets? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so here's here's the one thing that I'll say is a lot of I hear a lot of people go, oh, it's it's so easy now. Think, you know, things go away, things come and go. Um, and what I'll say is we are still committed to developing leaders of character. At the core, at the core, I, I believe that the Air Force Academy is the same of who we're trying to develop and what we're trying to do. Um, on the periphery, though, we have to sort of evolve with the people who, who we're pulling in, who we're bringing in to meet them where they are. So um, some things do change. Um, you know, and there's there's some of the programs that were here um, when I was a cadet that aren't here anymore. But there's a lot of programs that are here now that weren't here when I was a cadet, and I wish they were. I mean, things that I could be involved in that would have had an impact on me like I can't even imagine. Um, so things are, are a bit different. One of the things I always hear is that the cadets aren't as good as um, good of athletes or, you know, that they're not as committed to that as – that is a bunch of garbage. These guys, they are fit. In fact, the, the class of 2024 had the highest Air Force fitness test scores of any uh, four degree class in history this year. So um, these guys aren't, they're, they're not weak. They're not um, couch potatoes or whatever. I hear that from people. I don't understand where it comes from necessarily, but that's not the kind of person that we're getting here. We still require them to be um, every bit as a well-rounded person um, as we ever have. And, uh, and we still uh, demand that they take care of themselves and that they develop holistically as we ever have. And character is at the center of that, that development and it always will be. So yeah, there's some things that are different for sure. And things will continue to change and evolve. And um, I'm sure while I'm here that things will change. Um, but, but at, at its core, we're still the same. So I, I hope people will trust me on that one. So with that, you're talking about the physically fit cadets and things like that. With COVID, what are they able to do? I know that they're, you know, they're on online classes now. Is the gym still open for them? Are they still able to go out and get that physical fitness in to kind of help with the mental health and just the overall well-being of the cadet? So that's a great question. And, and honestly, the gym was the is the one outlet that they had that we had to keep open because we knew we would have a riot if we closed the gym. And that ought to tell you something about these folks. They were like, okay, you can close whatever, you can lock the gates, don't close the gym. Uh, so we had to put some strict rules in place so that we could separate them. They have to wear masks, they have to do all the things, but we had to leave the gym open. They also have the great outdoors. All the hiking trails, running trails. I see cadets out running all the time. They're hiking, they're biking, they're doing all those things um, because that really is right now, especially one of the few outlets that they have. So um, we, we, um, we did leave the gym open, limited numbers, but physical fitness is very important to them. And it, it just goes back to the last point that I made 
I mean, they're every bit as committed to that as we are. You know, they're CrossFitters, they're athletes, they're 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 just committed to that aspect of or that pillar of our academy development. That's great. We have a question that just came in. So, are all the cadets on base? I know some are living off in hotels to try to help with that quarantine and isolation uh, levels in the different dorms. So, are they back? Or are they off? Is it still a mixture? Yeah, it's a, we have some that are in hotels, um, and the reason that we had to do that primarily was for swing space so that we could have places to put our, our quarantined and isolated cadets. Um, our, our basic approach to, to COVID is really to put, put a bubble right now with, with the number of uh, infected cadets that we have. We've put a bubble around uh, the cadet wing. We did 100% testing. We pulled out all the positives that we could find, which we think we got 90 to 95%. We isolate them and then we quarantine their close contacts. And we've been doing some semblance of that the whole time um, where, we can, where we quarantine and isolate those to move them out of the population. But right now, especially we needed some additional swing space. So we have uh, a few additional rooms right now that we've had, but the hotel um, opportunity is, some, is something that we've been doing now for quite some time, just to give us that extra room for the quarantine and isolation. Um, so that we can really keep our cadet wing healthy and and uh, and hopefully defeat COVID. Are you anticipating that after winter break that there'll be still some cadets at the hotel or are you anticipating the whole cadet wing back at USAFA? So I think we'll probably have to have the hotel option. Uh, whether we use it or not, I don't know. That's gonna be conditions dependent. And, and honestly, all of our decisions, a lot of people want to put timelines on the decisions that we make, but our decisions right now are, are very much conditions based. So we, we look at where we are, we pull the levers that we need to, to adjust, and then we go from there. So we're going to have to have that swing space in case things get worse, um, that we can swing the cadets out, we can move into quarantine and isolation in the empty parts of its side john right now, side john hall. And, uh, and be able to manage the, uh, the, the pandemic the best we can. Um, when we do put them in the hotel, we have all the, the mechanisms there. They're able to eat, they're able to get transportation to and from the cadet area, and we have supervision down there to help them um, with the things that they need to do. So um, that hotel option is working out pretty well for us. Um, we also have other options that we're looking at on base, like the Furl, which is out near Jack's Valley, the, um, let's see, for all the field engineering research laboratory has dormitory space that we're looking at to use there as well. And honestly, the cadets would rather stay there um, than, than go to the hotel because it's closer and it's kind of cool because they're, you know, it's like a deployed location for them. So that's another opportunity that we're looking at as well. Well, great to know that you have a plan for, hopefully everybody gets to leave for winter break and then they all get to come back safely and enjoy that time at home. So this is probably gonna be the last question. So you can have a few minutes to, to wrap up. I know you said you had a few words, um, but this is a question I get a lot in my position. It comes in all the time is, how can the grad community help support the cadets? That's a great question. So first um, I would say to be engaged with the AOG, because I think a lot of the things that that we do and that we need, we communicate through the AOG and, uh, and they can help um, direct what we need. Um, right now, um, one of the really important things that we would hope to get some, some help on is communicating with our cadets during this tough time uh, of COVID-19. And in the springtime, we had opportunities for grads to write to um, cadets to share their thoughts, to give support, just to, to give them that boost. Um, we're, we want to open up that opportunity again so that our grads can start reaching out to our cadets and, and again, just give them the, the lift that they need because you can imagine, I mean, these this is still a service academy. It's still tough, academically rigorous, and they're locked down. They can't move around. They don't have the freedom of movement that they had before. And they've been in that situation since last uh, March. It is tough. If you think it was tough when you went through, 
you you got nothing on what these guys have. I don't, you know, and, and I had the toughest class ever in history of the Air Force Academy, probably of all service academies. And what these guys are going through is tougher. So so they could really use that outward support. So I think that our team is going to look really to uh, coordinate that with uh, with the AOG um, for opportunities for for grads to reach out cadet to cadets. So I, I hope that our grad community um, will take advantage of that. Um, and we'll get some uh, more information to you, Michelle, on that so that that everyone who's listening spread the word, please. And uh, and we'll have that uh, information for you to uh, get out to the grad community to really connect with our cadets. They need it right now. Um, yeah. yeah. I've been in contact with people in strategic communications. We're already on it. Um, we should have something hopefully launching out tomorrow uh, to to get those letters of encouragement out to the cadets. That's great. I we really really appreciate that. Um, I, I'll I'll throw one more plug out there. Um, I, I am they the you, you mentioned uh, strategic communications. They're making me um, update my LinkedIn page. It it's been. I, when I when I logged in the other day, they told me to log in, and I got an email from LinkedIn that said, "Welcome back. We haven't seen you in a decade," because I'm not too good with social media. But they're trying to make me savvy, and they said part of my savviness is telling people that I'm on social media. So uh, they they asked me to communicate that out there. So if you want to see something or communicate, um, I'm on LinkedIn. I don't even know how to get on LinkedIn yet, but. But I'm on there, and it's Rich Clark, so you will you could find me, Yusafa Soup. Um, so I, I, I was told to put that plug in, so I, I did it. I get a gold star for that one. Um, but, but really, just continuous development or continuous uh, support for the development of our cadets is what, what we could ask for from our alumni. Just stay engaged. Um, we appreciate that. And, I you know, I get a lot of letters and emails and – from the time that I was announced to come here to now, I've gotten a lot from people. And and I'll be honest with you, it, it makes me feel good. Some of it I don't, you know, it's not as friendly as, as others, but, but the fact that people care about our school is so, so important. Whether what you have to say is that, you know, that we're dropping the ball or that we're the best thing ever, either way, People care, and that's what matters to me, that, that people still want our school to be great and to continue to become greater. So so I, I hope that people will, will remain engaged and, and still love our school. Great. Do you have any other closing statements you'd like to make? Um, so I, I just um, I just want to say that trust me when I when I tell you that our cadets are every bit as talented, every bit as committed, every bit as patriotic as we ever were, and, and that they are still ready to go out there and, uh, and make our nation as, as great as it can be. Um, they want to compete. They have a competitive mindset. And I'm, you know, for the last 35 years now, I've been uh, serving with, with cadets, uh, graduates from the Air Force Academy. Um, and now to our Space Force, we have cadets going in there, and they are just phenomenal. They are phenomenal. And I've been the beneficiary of that as a commander, a couple NAFs, wings, squadrons, um, and USAFA grads are hard charging, and they're getting it done for us, and they will continue to do that. And I promise to you that I will do everything I can to keep that as, as our product uh, out to the Space Force, to the Air Force, and to our country and I appreciate the help from all of our alumni and all our grads to keep doing the same thing because we're going to be doing this for, you know, decades, centuries to come. And we just have to stay engaged as, as grads to keep our school great. So thank you, Michelle, so much uh, for the time. Thank you to everybody who dialed in. Really appreciate you showing the interest that you have. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys in person uh, once it stops and we get all of our you know, our reunions back and, and people are coming back to the, uh, to the academy. I look forward to seeing everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Clark. Um, I wanna thank everybody for attending as well. Um, as stated, we are working on launching a letters of encouragement campaign along with um, some other things. So 
look for information coming out starting tomorrow on how you can help and get involved and support the, the cadets as they make their way to winter break. Um, that is all we have for tonight. Thank you again.